ഓക്കെ ഷുവർ ഗുഡ് ഈവനിങ് എവറി ബോഡി ആൻഡ് താങ്ക് യു ശ്രീലങ്കൻ നാച്ചുറൽ ഹിസ്റ്ററി സൊസൈറ്റി ഫോർ ഇൻവൈറ്റിംഗ് മീ ടു ഡെലിവർ ദിസ് ടോക്ക് അബൌട്ട് അവർ റിസർച്ച് ദ സിസ്റ്റമാറ്റിക് റിസറക്ഷൻ ഓഫ് ഹണുമാൻ ഫ്ലോവർ വിതൗട്ട് ഫർദർ ഡു വിൽ മൂഡ് ദ പ്രസൻറ്റേഷൻ ബിക്കോസ് ഐ തിങ്ക് വി ഓൾറെഡി പാസ് സം ടൈം ഐ വോണ്ടഡ് ടു എംബസൈസ് the title from dunes to jeans and i made this uh, bit clumsy cover page uh, i'm sorry about the complexity but i wanted to show the uh, the complex nature of this research because at first uh, i want to say that the most common question i get asked is Uh, Jude did you find that bird while uh, walking in mana like so and so so the so some sometimes people tend to think that uh, we as a research group or myself or professor sampath my mentor so we uh, we when we uh, when we are working in mana so we uh, found this bird and we uh, we described it, it as a new species Uh, okay okay thank you that's not true but that's a way of describing new species that's true and uh, for regarding our research we went from these dunes to jeans so we dig deep into the uh, into these plovers to look up what they are making of who are their ancestors what they are related to and what they are doing in these lands so uh, this whole talk is based on this title from dunes to jeans as you can see you can see the uh, mana sand dunes in the left side of this presentation and the uh, nest of the hanuman flower and some comparisons and all the things in the right that are uh, from our research and so <coughs> uh a research to be a research should be published so uh, we recently uh, published our research in the uh, the top uh, international journal of avian sciences ibis as a systematic revision of the uh, kentish plover and to uh, resurrect as the uh, hanuman plover so uh, this is not uh, my Uh, so all discovery this is work of a big local and international scientists inclu- including uh, my uh, research supervisor mentor the uh, professor sampath seniviratna uh, and so we were able to describe this uh, hanuman plover as a new species uh, with the help of all these members from this group first of all uh, to get an introduction about the hanuman plover i have to uh, uh, go to the uh, kentish plovers i think as uh, the uh, members of the natural history society uh, you all may know about the kentish plovers they are they are widely known and kentish plovers are really common in the mud flats <coughs> and uh, they are first described in uh, 1758 by the uh, by linnaeus who uh, invented the binomial nomenclature and this name alexandrinus comes from the uh, region of alexandria which is an ancient city in egypt so you can uh, see that uh, the kentish plovers has gained attention of uh, attention since the uh, since the ancient times so i added uh, these pictures uh, from the old books uh, birds of great britain and the uh, birds of europe so in these uh, in these pictures you can see the uh, nest of the uh, kentish plover and uh, the kentish plover get got its vernacular name from the uh, from their occurrence in the breeding grounds at the uh, country of kent in southeastern england so when we come to our research uh, we got to uh, discover that the hanuman plover or uh, previously known as a subspecies of this uh, the 
the bigger kentish flower complex <coughs> has been diverged from the from their ancestral lineage from before a uh, before uh, 1.19 million years ago and now it as a separate lineage so uh, why why this uh, the whole big kentish flower complex is important to us it's because <coughs> it act as uh, uh, as an indicator about the habitats the ecosystem they live as well as for the conservation status and especially for us to the contribution uh, to the avian research uh, in this uh, whole slide you can see the distribution of the old world kentish flower complex why i uh, use the uh, term old because uh, there were six subspecies identified uh, from the whole kentish flower complex before 2009 and uh, with the intense research and uh, when the new gates are open with the new technology especially in the uh, genetic analysis and uh, all those things so the world uh, slowly get to know that these entities are reproductively isolated from each other in other facts so the uh, the whole kentish flower complex was uh, considered as a cosmopolitan distributed or they occur in the all the continents all over the uh, globe but <coughs> uh, uh, as you can see in this map uh, north of uh, 40 degree breeders are considered as winter migrants usually and the uh, the uh, uh, in blue color the winter visitors uh, the free zoom meeting has ended you, you're the host now. Yeah, yeah. Now I can share my screen and uh, control. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Yes, your screen. Uh, so we left here, right? Yes. Right okay. here. This so, one. Shall I start now? Yes, go ahead. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> as I said before, so uh, with this cosmopolitan distribution, uh, Kentish flowers were all over the globe ah. uh, can you please uh, mute we need you to mute your uh, the participants please <coughs> you have to mute yourselves it's disturbing otherwise okay <coughs> okay uh, so uh, in certain certain areas there are year round residents so uh, uh, with the definitions uh, we'll go to that slide later and uh, we know these uh, the geographically distinctive entities can act as subspecies or different from the nominal uh, species like like this kentish flower so uh, in 2009 a study suggested that uh, the uh, the snowy flower or the uh, charadrius neosus which uh, which is uh, distributed along the uh, the american american continent are considered to be a separate species due to its limited gene flow with the uh, ancestral kentish flower lineage so as uh, as in in 2018 an, another study suggested that that was uh, done in the uh, coastal areas of the chinese regions uh, the white chinese white flesh flower or charadrius delbetus to be treated as a separate species due to, due to its uh, limited gene flow uh, among the populations of the or the original kentish flower subspecies so uh, we left with the question that whether the charadrius alexandrinus seabomi which was the old uh, subspecies that bred in uh, sri lanka and southeastern india to be uh, treated as a species or whether it's the same uh, subspecies that uh, share the genetic materials with its sister components so uh, in our study we got to know that there's limited uh, gene flow or no gene flow at all and we suggested the species status uh, before going to that slide i'll i'll show you <coughs> so uh, the most of the uh, the plumage differences 
they are confined to the head regions of these flowers so as you can see they in the uh, the first two pictures the the nominal kentish flower it has a very rufous cap rather compared to all of these other entities uh -huh. so uh, i added this slide because uh, you might uh, want to know uh, what are the the known can be seen in the field the plumage differences between the kentish flower and the hanuman flower so uh, i would say most of the time the breeding plumage has the <coughs> the very distinctive uh, plumage difference because the kentish flower has a very rufous cap and a complete frontal ilo you can see in this picture like uh, this ilo is complete rather compared to the hanuman flower which has an incomplete ilo as well as it has a duller cap compared to kentish flower even in the breeding plumage so in the non breeding plumage the male does not have the rufous cap because the rufous cap gets faded away uh, due to the molting and the uh, the male uh, hanuman flowers they lost the the complete clarity in ilos for her stripes and as well as the shoulder patches so uh, in the female the female uh, hanuman flower resembles the female kentish flower which does not have a rufous cap cap as well as the forehead stripe and does not have the shoulder patches as well so uh, this feature this males having much more prominent breeding plumage has allow these females to identify their respective uh, races or the groups of males when it comes to the uh, breeding behaviors uh, i added these uh, two three slides to give you a brief idea about these uh, speciation processes and how these incipient speciations work so when considering forming a new species so uh, there are uh, widely uh, known uh, four ways of uh, making uh, forming a new species these are evolutionary processes for, uh, so each of these uh, the cyan circle represents a new Uh, uh original ancestral population so in the allopatric mode so there is a geographical barrier forms and uh, eventually the uh, with this with this barrier the reproductive reproductive isolation occurs in the uh, separated populations and eventually they become a distinct species as well as the peripatric parapatric and the other uh, modes of speciation so they uh, eventually allow the uh, the species to become new Correct. species with no gene flow among the uh, populations so uh, the definition of species uh, changes over the time with the knowledge on species and how we define a boundary to a species or a subspecies so in general we consider a species a one species as a group of living organisms Uh, which has the similar individuals capable of exchanging genes in a gene pool cool, or they can interbreed and produce offsprings in a subspecies so uh, we consider it as a geographically isolated uh, from the uh, the mother species and uh, they have uh, different morphological characteristics as i uh, showed in this previous slide so uh, these entities has different morphological features uh considering their plumage so in this allopatric mode of speciation uh, uh with a million years of time this process does not happen in a few hundred years uh, it takes millions of millions years of time uh, to uh, generate new traits uh, new polymorphisms uh, new morphological new characters new plumage characters so this happens from the the species they become the local breeding populations in this case uh, this hanuman flower is a local breeding populations in uh, sri lanka and southeast india could you please uh, mute the uh, okay i'll mute it mute it okay sure uh, <clears throat> 
so as uh, this hanuman plover became a reproductively isolated separate species uh, with the process of uh, allopatric speciation so uh, after the time in mid pleistocene uh, hanuman plovers become reproductively isolated from the uh, the old kentish kentish plover complex uh to form a new species uh, there are a lot of theories that comes into this stage but uh, i want to uh, give a general introduction about uh, how this happened and uh, usually uh, these things these uh, theories are explained in the island biogeography theory so uh, uh, consider uh, the migratory ancestral forms when they become unable to fly back due to many reasons like physical defects or uh, physiological problems maybe behavior like uh, can't uh, get a mating partner to fly back or sometimes the ecological reasons though they are all uh, they all uh, sometimes when they unable to fly back so they have to adapt to the new environment so in the case of sri lanka as a tropical country uh, still, uh, we in our environment the birds who are unable to fly back they face high predatory pressure as well as increased human impact and they have higher competition for food area and mates when compared the the temperate regions where they breed and they have a vulnerable breeding plumage with a very distinctive colors like the rufous cap so they are vulnerable to predators so they uh, eventually with the time they adapt to the new environment and the selection processes naturally or sexually arise so we call it the natural selection or the sexual selection so uh, with these adaptations reproductive isolation occurs within these populations and they then they become to appear distinct features from their original populations so these uh, features can be colorations sometimes the uh, differentiations in plumage sometimes uh, physiological uh, and the behavioral changes so uh, all uh, all of these changes tend to form a new species uh when we come to our research we sampled uh kentish uh in our research we sampled hanuman plovers uh from the mana region and uh, in this map you can see we also got the uh, bird ringing program uh, samples from the bundel national park and as well as uh, some museum specimen that were collected from kokilai and pulmude and kantale so uh, we compared our data actually we uh, collected our samples in the breeding season because the because we wanted to avoid any conflict with the uh, migratory forms with, which is the kentish plover uh, so we confined to uh, sample only in the breeding season so we can ensure that they all are the uh, hanuman plovers and we compared our data sets with the uh, alexanders which is the kentish plover and the uh, white faced plover from the chinese regions and uh, we uh, when we collect the bird uh, we uh, got samples from them uh, biometrics and uh, some uh, blood samples as well as we ring them i will show the importance of ringing a bird in the next slides and uh, then th- then we release the birds uh, at the uh, field sites as well so you can see uh, we can we, we also got the uh, samples from uh, nests as well uh, the biometrics and all the measurements uh, as well as so we use this kind of uh, methods mentioned in uh, this paper uh, the modified round trap uh, to catch the birds and we also went through the 
most uh, went through almost all of the major museum collections all over the world uh, and uh, so uh, i uh, made this collage photo collage from the from our field work so the, this is professor sambath and uh, Miss Gayamini uh, working with me. We all uh, sampled from the uh, from the Vedithaladu area as well as the uh, this, uh, despite uh, getting uh, samples from the Adams Bridge. Uh, They've been working on this for a long time. Yeah, actually uh, we've been uh, working for uh, three four years. Uh, there are some people in the waiting room. Uh, I think I have to admit them into the uh, uh, discussion. So uh, I was admitting a few people while I was doing the talk. And can someone take over the uh, this thing? Okay. So uh, so ringing birds is important because we can track them in the field. Uh, so with these resites and uh, especially in these breeding populations, so we get to know about <coughs> the birds' bill and their uh, the animal. Uh, uh, Jeez. Sorry, there's a lot of disturbance coming from someone. Okay. Yeah, I muted some of them. Okay. Uh, so our research, uh, composed of several uh, vast fields, including the phenotype, genotype, and behavioral and ecological analysis, as well as the uh, taxonomic analysis. I I'm not going into uh, deep into the uh, uh, into details, uh, but this for this complete study, we have utilized more data more from from more than. Thousand individual birds. Actually, uh, uh, all all these are pulled from the uh, as I showed earlier from as from uh, from Sri Lanka and as well as from the Chinese regions. Okay, uh, in in our results, we got to know that uh, regarding the phenotype of the Hanuman plover. Uh, their size compared to the other sister subspecies or uh, the uh, nom nominal Kentish plover or the DL betas. So they, uh, they are quite large in size and the uh, Hanuman plover is quite small compared to uh, these other sister taxa. So in this uh, graphs you can see the wing length is uh, quite smaller as well as the uh, tarsus and the tail is also uh, quite small compared to other taxa. Uh, especially regarding the wing morphology, uh, I have also uh, published an abstract in the uh, Wild Lanka Symposium in 2020 about the uh, wing morphology of, uh, of the wing, mo wing morphological difference in these. Uh, to uh, entities because the wing has played a vital role in their speciation process because uh, usually the migratory birds they have very elongated wings compared to the other resident or forest birds as you can see in this silhouette uh, so a forest bird has a much more shorter wing compared to the long distance migrants because uh, they uh, the the long distance migrants have to uh, use the shape of this wing uh, for their uh, long distance journeys effectively to consume energy uh, to glide through the air also they have you as you can see in these pictures there are some tertiary uh, feathers prominent in uh, these migrants that allow them to make a pseudo wing that are also used as a glider to move through the air. Okay, uh, regarding the molting pattern, uh, Hanuman plovers are more closely aligned, has a more closely aligned uh, molting pattern with uh, the white faced plover, which is 
the which inhabits the chinese regions uh, probably are driven from their similar nature of non migratory uh, behavior also these uh, taxa they they have a very early molt uh, into breeding plumage in september to october so uh, compared to other uh, kentish plovers which uh, molt into breeding plumage from january to march uh, so this uh, molting patterns lets the hummingbird plovers to show a suspended or uh, we say an arrested molt uh, before immediately uh, immediately before the uh, breeding season in april and uh, regarding all of these uh, phenotypic characters uh, we uh, use the uh, tobias criteria of uh, character delimitation to evaluate the magnitude discourse uh, so there are uh, it needs seven uh, it needs seven points to delimit it as a species and we calculated all of uh, 11 points of magnitude discourse from cons d to uh, make a sig- to to justify the significance between the uh, phenotypic characters i'm show- showing you all of these because i wanted to show you how complex is this research uh, this is not just uh, we we didn't just uh, get a bird and uh, do some uh, small analysis and uh, and describe it as a new species this is a whole uh, this is a this is a whole lot of uh, research that dived into many vast areas to define it as a species so uh, this is the uh, one of the main components in our research that we did uh, microsatellite genotyping to make structure plots of bayesian genetic clustering uh, i'm not going into details i just wanted to show you uh, these figures so uh, in this structure plot each of this line you can see this uh, the, there are tiny lines that these uh, plots in the uh, the violet and orange color so uh, these plots are made of tiny lines and each of this line has uh, has a color code so this color code typically represents the uh, proportion of genetic material that they got from different populations so uh, as i uh, said earlier kentish we sampled kentish plovers from the chinese region as well as the snowy plover uh, and then uh, we got uh, our samples from sri lanka uh, as you can see in this uh, in this red color they represent the hornbill plover while this uh, purple color represent the kentish plover and this orange color represent the uh, white faced plover in chinese regions so uh, this plot shows a limited or no gene flow among these uh, from hornbill plover between the other system Uh, <laughs> okay uh, so uh, this approach allows us to uh, visually represent why the amount is statistically calculated from the fst values uh, that's uh, that's uh, in uh, this study so uh, consider the low value we started we can statistically say that uh, this has a limited gene flow between the uh, taxa so as well as the uh, genotyping we did a phylogenetic analysis to know the the phylogenetic position of the hanuman plover so in this uh, group you can see uh, i uh, highlighted the uh, clade of the hanuman plover as well as uh, you can see the uh, cl- uh, the dl betas and alexandrinus is clustered into the into the other group while this the the lineage which shown in the red lines shows the hanuman plover as well as we have this haplotype networks uh, which shows the uh, derivations from the uh, original lineages to the 
hanuman flower uh, so these uh, red dots represent hanuman flowers while the other colors and um, other uh, pie charts show the am amount of uh, population that used in this analysis as well as the uh, distance to their uh, regions that we considered okay uh, so uh, here comes the uh, most interesting parts of this research the taxonomic study and the historical records that we have about uh, hanuman flowers so hanuman flowers was never treated as a separate species before that's why we have to uh, bring it back as a separate entity or a separate species to this uh, to this whole literature and uh, as i mentioned earlier kentish flowers has a very uh, long driven history as well as this uh, the tropical kentish flower or the hanuman flower which is uh, first uh, mentioned in this catalog by holzer in uh, 1869 uh, and uh, he uh, misidentified it as a, a separate species uh, a, a separate a separate entity in a in a separate in a in a in a different entity uh, but uh, in 1888 henry seaborn uh, which first identified uh, the the diminutive or the smallest uh, race or the subspecies of Kentish flower based on the differences in its body size and plumage and in uh, in his book the geographical distribution of the family charadulidae of the flowers so he mentioned about the uh, tropical Kentish flower as charadrius cantianus minatus and with the time here comes the most important publication to us which was published in the same journal we published the uh, our article ibis which is in 1915 actually uh, uh, hartred and jackson who uh, who uh, identified charadrius alexandrinus seabomi as the subspecies of uh, so in this uh, in their uh, publication they have mentioned that charadrius cantianus minutus is uh, not the uh, not the uh, synonym and uh, and this should be corrected as charadrius alexandrinus seabomi as a subspecies of kentish flower and uh, after 200 years with the new technology and all the new implications implications we uh, could describe this as a separate species and elevate its taxonomic status to a separate species and uh, I personally uh, this is kind of achievement to us because of this publication okay uh, as I mentioned earlier uh, this specimen uh, we uh, define we uh, assigned this as the electrotype and this is from the uh, Holdsworth collection uh, now this specimen is in the American Museum of Natural History. Uh, this specimen has gone a long journey to the American Museum. From uh, this was collected from uh, Aripu uh, in uh, in Mana region in Sri Lanka in uh, in March of 1869 by Holzer. And this lectotype was initially misunderstood identified as uh, as an another entity by Holzer and then uh, then uh, this this was described as Hartert and Jackson uh, while this was in the Walter Rothschild, Rothschild's private collection in Kring and then uh, he sold this entire collection to the American Museum of Natural History in uh, 1930s and now uh, this is uh, currently deposited permanently in the uh, MNH and uh, even in our natural history museum in, uh, in in our national museum there are 13 skin specimen 
uh, that can be treated as the uh, paraelectrodipes uh, so all in all after all these uh, genetic phenotypic and the uh, the the allochronic uh, migratory pattern as well as the non overlapping breeding range uh, with all these things we applied the taxonomic position of uh, Hanuman flower to species level in our paper and we disrupted the most suitable synonym as uh, and finally uh, with the vernacular name Hanuman flower and the scientific name as Charadria sibomi so as you can see in the right side uh, there is a male and female Hanuman flower uh, in the males the ilo is incomplete that's the the very distinguishable feature that can be seen in male Hanuman flowers uh, while the uh, females uh, has this uh, all over the uh, from from the uh, end of the beak to the end of the eye uh, so the zoom says we only have 10 minutes left i think uh, we can we can uh, continue after like like we did before okay uh, this is a picture of uh, can hanuman flower nest as you can see it is well camouflaged it's really hard to uh, identify the hatchlings and the egg in this nest uh, if you uh, don't know or um, can't identify it as the first class, so it's just among the don donkey poop in the ground on the ground. So, Hanuman flowers, as uh, they are ground nesting birds, they just lay two eggs on the uh, on, a, on a on a little uh, dump in the ground, and then they put uh, some shells, some leaves and uh, that's that's not no no not not a not, not a nest like a forest bird uh, but this is the nest that they make so <coughs> uh, we observed that the both parents participate in incubating the eggs uh, and so shortly after hatching the female bird takes the chick and uh, it moves away with the chick so uh, in the, uh, the the bottom right picture you can see the uh, female hanuman flower with its chick uh, the name hanuman why we gave that name hanuman uh, as the the flower's name uh, it's because our field sites are mostly composed of the uh, adams bridge as known as the ramas bridge which is the which is uh, believed to be uh, constructed by the uh, the Hindu ape god uh, Hanuman, so that's why uh, we proposed the name Hanuman flower to honor our field sites in Mana, and uh, we believe uh, with this uh, suggestion uh, we can uh, drive more attention to the uh, species as well as to ensure the uh, its endemic uh, the regional endemicity of this pork bay region and the uh, uh, and to uh, more uh, blend with the uh, people in this region okay so uh, uh, with this discovery uh, Hanuman flower just went into the world with uh, uh, recognition from some institution like the natural history museum as well as uh, my university and so we uh, Hanuman flower was featured in many mainstream media in newspapers and news and we had we delivered some webinars as well so with all this publicity uh, we can uh, we could uh, take this whole discovery into a whole new level so uh, I want to say uh, this whole thing works in and it helps to uh, mainly to their conservation measures so I want to say the Hanuman flowers and their breeding ranges all this Mana Island is now at risk uh, we all know with the increasing population with the increasing human population 
and uh, the encroachment pollution as well as the predators like dogs that comes with the human and also the mega infrastructure developments like the highways ports and the uh, windmills and the wind farms so they become uh, major threats to their habitats so uh, so as sri lanka at the uh, end of the funnel of the uh, central asian flyway we host a lot more and uh, very uh, important species in our wetlands especially in mana this vegetative uh, nature reserve uh, as well as the uh, the whole adams bridge national park so uh, not only this hanuman flower research i want to mention that uh, our research team we along with professor sampath senviratna uh, we uh, do lot of gps gsm tagging of the important uh, showbirds that comes to this wetland so all these things all together along with the discovery of hanuman flower that let us uh, bring the conservation efforts and the conservation measures in this areas to a whole new level so uh, this pompe region and the mana is very very crucial to the uh, as over entering sites for a lot of migratory water birds especially uh not not only the migratory bird but especially the region regional endemics like hanuman flower and uh, so uh, with all these things uh, we able to conduct uh, several uh, awareness programs especially aiming the school children so we can make a difference uh, in their minds to drive them towards the conservation and this discovery of hanuman flower in this ecosystem in this in their area has a significant value when it comes to the uh, this conservation awareness workshops so uh, this project is uh, not our sole work there are a lot of people and a lot of organization including fog the wildlife uh, department of sri lanka as well as the logistics provided by wayo and the palmyra house uh, i want to mention that my research group avian sciences and conservation led by professor sampath senaviratne and uh, all this research came from my uh, uh, i did uh, this as my final year undergraduate thesis so uh, my supervisors were professor sampath senaviratne and professor yang liu uh, from uh, university of sunnet sen in china and all these people helped uh in various ways to uh, make this project a success and i think now uh, uh we can have a little discussion or a question and answer session uh if you are muted please raise your hand also wala monhari singhalen gahanna dinana gahanna it's okay uh thank you joe that was uh Anyone who has questions, please unmute and ask, or post it on the chat box. Uh, well, Jules, uh, in uh, your uh, uh, fantastic work with you and uh, Dr. Sampath Seniratne, congratulations to the team. Thank you. Uh, just one question. Ah, uh, what uh, one one aspect uh, which uh, uh, I didn't see uh, uh, is uh, 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 any vocalization differences. Uh, yeah, ac the, yeah. Actually, uh, uh, actually, we sampled some uh, vocalizations from the Hanuman flower and compared with the other Kentish flower and the Snowy flower data. but we didn't included it in the uh, the whole analysis because uh, actually uh, we wanted to make sure uh, our the our number of samples were quite uh, lower uh, when uh, considered to the other aspects of this research so we didn't include that in the uh, the original research article but but yes we did and we identified uh, several different uh differences in the uh, vocalizations and uh, i want to mention that uh, compared to the passerines uh, they are songbirds 
and uh, these are showbird so they uh, so these guys uh, do not use uh, their vocalizations uh, rather compared to their breeding plumage so uh, so this uh, hanuman plovers or any other plover they they usually they they more focus when 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 comes to the sexual selection uh, they more focus on the breeding plumage rather the acoustics and that's it yeah thank you very much that's uh, pretty interesting uh, because i i have seen them uh, sing in the uh, i have seen them sing uh, and they seem other than uh, the other subspecies probably i i, I really couldn't remember exactly uh, uh, so th that's that so thank you so much you then uh, uh, Dr. Sampath and his team has done a brilliant job uh, in uh, highlighting Adams Ridge as uh, possibly one of the most important uh, birding areas in Sri Lanka and uh, the, uh, uh, enriching and also conserving the, the flyway, apart from the fact that um, there are many other green species there from the turns to the noddies and then the bridal turns over there on Adam's page. So uh, thank you so much for doing so much. Uh, and there was a lot of doubt uh, initially when uh, when it was publicized that this was a new species. Yeah. Uh, a lot of the birders uh, was in doubt as to uh, whether this could be a new species. Uh, uh, so congratulations to uh, having getting this paper published in IBIS, uh, the, the the top most uh, bird in journal. So, congratulations and thank you on behalf of the Natural History Society uh, uh, for uh, helping us with this uh, talk and, and, and clarifying it. You did pretty much well. It's very interesting that we are in a window of uh, uh, speciation uh, and uh, congratulations and I hope uh, you do more work uh, on uh, uh, because I, I think uh, Dr. Sampat's work has, uh, is now uh, getting universal and a lot of uh, yeah. uh, work done, which is, which is really fantastic. It has brought birding uh, uh, to a different level in Sri Lanka. Otherwise, we were uh, <laughs> pretty much behind considering the rest of the world. So thank you, Jude, and uh, Dr. Sampat, and Virat as well, and his team, and... Uh, Thank you, for you to, thank you for you to giving me opportunity to uh, clarify these doubts and all those things yeah. and I think uh, uh, from this talk uh, perhaps you get the, uh, the the broader picture of this research right thank you very yes. much thank you very much Jude. thank you Jude. I'm sorry thank about you. Uh, technical difficulties and the delays and the problems, but uh, you managed mm -hmm. to put it through. Thanks a lot. You're welcome.